Turner. I'm one of the school counselors here at Park Vista. And on behalf of the school counseling department, we welcome you to our first Coffee Talk of the Year. And this year we have kind of a new topic. We are doing the college application process. However, it's in relation to our state university system. We want to spotlight today our 12 universities that we have here in the state of Florida, all public universities and the advantages to go into these schools. Um, we're going to talk about the college application process in relation to these universities. And also we're going to give you a little description of each school. Uh, you, have, you should have two handouts. One is the yellow packet that has some flyers that I'll be referring to occasionally. And then you have a copy of the PowerPoint. So you can take notes as we do this uh, presentation. Um, please keep in mind, and I kind of said this while people were coming in, this presentation is being recorded, and it will be on our Park Vista website. If you go on the PVCHS website and click the school counseling tab, you're going to find a whole bunch of information, not just um, presentations, but college admission information, scholarships, community service, information about transcripts. And under the Coffee Talk tab, this will be on there. So if you have friends or um, acquaintances that could not make it, or if you need to look at it again, the PowerPoint and the presentation will be on there. So we are going to focus on all these universities today. And first we want to talk about what are the advantages to attending a state university. And we understand that your children are going to want to apply everywhere. We get that, in state, out of state, and, and they should. But today we're just going to focus on what would be the advantage of staying here in Florida, um, whether it's your first or second choice. So first of all, we have nationally ranked schools here in Florida. The Cal um, US News and World Report just came out with their rankings over a week ago. And this is just a few examples of some schools that are nationally ranked in the top 100. University of Florida actually went from number eight to number seven. Florida State also climbed to number 18. USF number 44 and UCF number 79. And there's rankings, other schools in the state also have certain rankings in certain categories, like best value, most innovative. Um, a lot of this you can find online. So that's a big plus, that our, our universities are being recognized here in the nation. And we're actually, and this was, I was really pleasantly surprised about this, that Florida is ranked number one in higher education in our country. That's great, that's awesome news. Um, obviously they're taking into account all of our colleges here in Florida, not just our SUS schools, but still our SUS schools play a major role, seeing that there's 12 of them in the state. So that's great news. Another advantage is distance. Distance, I mean, wherever you go, if your child stays in the state, if you're only the longest, I think, it would take you is if your child goes to Pensacola, which is almost in the state, uh, that's about an eight hour drive. So anywhere you need to see your child or if your child needs to come home, it's only a, a day away or, or less than that. As close as 40 minutes if they go to FAU. So that's something to keep in mind. Also, when you're going to a state university, you tend to have more academic options. Uh, institutions tend to be a little bit larger than the private schools, uh, more majors and careers they want to study may be available at a state university. Uh, faculty, we have a lot of opportunities to do um, assistantships with professors. I've, I've had students graduate high school and after a year in college, they already have an opportunity to work uh, by doing research with a college professor and so forth that they may not have that opportunity maybe at a private school or if they went somewhere else. So these, there's a lot of academic options um, staying in state going to an SUS school. Activities. Again, with the larger schools, they're gonna, if your student is looking to be involved in clubs, fraternities, sororities, if they're looking for university with the big college influence, like football, um, Division I schools, and so forth, you're gonna see that more staying with a public university. There's gonna be a lot more um, variety there in things they can become involved in. Okay, another advantage is something that we can't deny is that it's cheaper. And I'm gonna kind of go over numbers with you just so you have an idea of how much it costs to stay doing college just one year um, at a public university. So I did a cost comparison here. I chose an in-state school, University of Florida, versus out-of-state, Ohio State is a public university, out-of-state, and then a private school, University of Miami. The numbers that I have here, that's just for one year of school. And that's including room and board, tuition, fees, um, 
you know, if they're driving gas, computer use, all that, that's all, all part of that big number you see. So yes, University of Florida, for one year is over 21,000, which is a lot of money already. But if they were to go out of state, Ohio State, this is just a school I pick because this is, I think Ohio State is like the third largest university in the nation. It's 46,000. And then a private school, and University of Miami is here, is here in Florida, but it's private. It's not under SUS. And that is 66,000. That number has climbed 6,000 since my son toured it like two or three years ago, and it was 60,000. So these numbers, can, they do rise after a few years. And this is just kind of the breakdown, just so you see what I'm talking about. So tuition alone uh, for a Florida resident for one year is going to be 4,000, but as you add up all the other numbers, like books and supplies, other fees, room and board, room and board alone is close to 10,000, then you're going to reach that 21,000. Out of state, someone who wants to come here, it's going to be, actually it's kind of a, it's going to be 42,000. Their tuition is going to be 25,000. So you see the difference between an in-state and out-of-state tuition? Um, it does pay to stay in the state in, in terms of money-wise. Um, Ohio State, again, I did the breakdown there. Um, if you live there, it was 27. If you live, if you're going there from Florida, you're going to be paying about 46,000. And again, this is a private school. It doesn't matter where you live, you're still going to be paying that 66,000. Now, this is not to discourage your children. Again, that's not our intention to discourage them to apply to out-of-state or private. They have scholarship opportunities. Sometimes a lot of these out-of-state schools have them scholarship incentives for out-of-state students because they want to attract students to their campus. They want to say, we have kids from Florida, from California, from Idaho. Uh, so my opinion or what my recommendation would be if your children are serious considering out-of-state or private schools is that they start looking at their scholarship opportunities that they have. A lot of it is on their website. They can contact the school. Um, when they do student tours there, they can give that information as well. So how can you save money? Because that 21,000 is still, that's a big chunk of change there, okay, for one year. Multiply that times four, that's how much you'll be paying for your child's college education in Florida. So what can offset that? Well, we have a wonderful program here in the state of Florida called Bright Futures, which I think most of you have heard about this. Uh, the Bright Futures Scholarship Program, uh, it, it comes from the state, it's based on the lottery system, you know, the money that's earned from the Florida lottery, a lot of money comes from there. Um, there's two main scholarships I'm going to talk about today, and that's the Florida Academic Scholars Program and the Florida Medallion. Both are scholarships under Bright Futures. Think of Bright Futures as the umbrella, and these are two scholarships. I'm focusing on these two because this helps pay for the four-year or two-plus-two university education here in Florida. So for Florida Academic, that one pays roughly 100% of tuition and some fees and $300 towards books for each semester. Okay, so it does go by semester. While the medallion pays 75%, and then uh, 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 including applicable fees. So how does, what does that look like? Okay, well, how much are you actually saving? Again, roughly tuition, books, supplies, and other fees for one year is going to be about $7,500 more or less. Again, every university is going to be a little bit off. This is just the average. So Bright Futures is going to pay, they have the 100%, the Florida Academic, which is the 100%. That'll play roughly about $6,755. So you would subtract that amount from there. And then the medallion, again, that's roughly 75%, but that's going to pay about $4,616 of that $7,000 ticket price up there. That's the roughly the total tuition. So you're, you're saving a lot of money. And with Bright Futures, what's nice is you can stack other scholarships with it. Uh, also, if you have prepaid, you can use both, okay, in the state of Florida. Um, and a lot of universities also, when you apply early, like by their priority deadline, they'll offer money on top of that as well, okay? If your student meets above what they look at, you know, they're an exceptional good student, they may have that um, offered to them by some of these state universities, extra scholarship money. Okay, and these are just the requirements for Florida Academic, and there have been some changes. Uh, for the class of 2020, so if you're a parent of a senior, sitting here right now, you're a parent of a senior, um, for them to earn this scholarship, they have to have a 3.5 weighted GPA. Now, weighted means that if they happen to have taken any AP honors or ACE classes, they are awarded extra value towards those grades. So an A is traditionally four points, B is three points, C is two, you know, when they do the GPA. So let's say they were in an honors class and they earned an A. Bright Futures will not assign it four points, it will assign it a 4.5. Okay, that's what it means by weighted. 
If they take an AP, ACE, or dual enrollment, the four points becomes five. So they'll award an extra quality point for AP, ACE, or dual enrollment. So this GPA is weighted, and it's only based on these courses. So it's not, our weighted GPA is our HPA here in the school system in Palm Beach County. But that's based on every course they've ever taken. And we do have some electives that are non, that are not academic classes that are considered honors. And so that's part of the equation there. This is just based on these classes. So your four English, your math, your algebra and geometry, algebra two, beyond, your three sciences, social studies, two years of a foreign language. Remember, to go into a four-year university in Florida, you have to have two consecutive years of the same language. So it's gonna be a total of 16 academic units that they're looking at. They recalculated. Hopefully they have a minimum of 3.5. 100 hours of community service. They have to have 100 hours. Class of 2020 has to have a 1290 on the SAT. The highest you can get on the SAT is a 1600. 800 on the verbal part, 800 on the math. Or 29 on the ACT. The ACT is a different test. They have a reading section, math, science, um, reading, math, uh, English, okay? And so it's 36 points in each section, so that's the average of the four. So it's a 29 out of 36. They super score, okay? And if you've been to other coffee talks, you may have heard of the phrase super score. Super score means that let's say you've taken the SAT more than one time, they're gonna take your highest verbal of those three or four times you've taken it, and then your highest math, and they combine it. That's super scoring. And they super score the ACT. So it's either or. They don't have to have both scores. It's just one or the other. Now, if you're a parent of someone who's a class of 21 or beyond, meaning our 9th, 10th, and 11th, guess what? They've changed the requirements a little bit. Yeah, they kind of tweaked it. So the new test scores starting with next year's senior class, for, for the four academic, they have to have a 1330 on the SAT. That's, that's the change okay, for that one. The ACT remains the, the same. So just keep that in mind. And also remember, this is always subject to change. I think they're looking at other changes in, in some years to come, but just keep in mind that this is always subject to change. The medallion was the one that pays the 75%. It's a 3.0 weighted in those same classes I listed before, 75 hours of community service, 1170 on the SAT or 26 on the ACT. Now, for the class of 21 and beyond, they did make some changes here as well, starting next year and then beyond. Uh, they have to have a combined score of a 1210 on the SAT, but then the ACT went down to a 25. So either or. Uh, so just keep in mind, always, you know, we try to inform you of these changes as we get them, but keep in mind that they can change it again next year. Yes. Yes, her question is, do you have to meet each requirement? Yes, you do. Yeah, so you have to have the three, the same with the academic, you have to have the three pointer, you have to have the 75 hours. With the test scores, it's either or, either the SAT or ACT. You don't have to have both. Okay, it's either or, whatever, which one's the best. Okay. All right, so moving right along. Okay, we're gonna kind of talk about the college application process. How do you apply to these universities, the public universities here in the state of Florida? I'm going to go over some basic steps, uh, but also before we start, I just want to bring to your attention that SUS, the state university system, you do have to meet some minimum requirements for them to consider an applicant. And the big thing here is when they look at your application, they first, when they look at the grades, which is the transfer, which is a record of all their final grades, they want to make sure that they're at least in the 2.5 to even look at them, and also that they're earning, now every college though, I'm, I don't want that 2.5 that to be a little bit deceiving. It's like, oh, they have a 2.5, they'll be able to get into Florida. Okay? So please keep in mind these are just minimum requirements for them to be eligible. Uh, they have to present SAT and ACT scores, but this is really important. That's the academic units. Uh, to be eligible for the state university system, a student has to have earned by the end of their senior year 18, a minimum of 18 academic units. I would say the majority of our college-bound uh, students here have more than that. Um, you're looking anywhere from like 22 to 30, okay, that they have. So you know, they've been doing at least, hopefully at least five academic classes per year and um, doing what they're supposed to, and a lot of them take more than that, but they're in good shape. Now those academic units need to be in their language arts, 
obviously English every year, science. That's why we're always pushing. Like, I, I still have kids that tell me, oh, Miss Turner, I'm gonna have my three sciences after my junior year, and that's for graduation, which they're true, but do I have to do science my senior year? You know, it doesn't matter what you're studying. Yeah, you should still have science your senior year. Or you should still have your math. You should, even though you, you may have maxed out on these credits I'm going over, they should still push themselves because that's what the universities want to see, that these students are not having a vacation their senior year and they are still taking at least five academics because that's one year before they're going to that four-year school, right? They don't want someone who's taking a break and then all of a sudden they have to do college prep work their freshman year of college. So preparation is, rigor is very important. So again, there are English credits, minimum of three sciences, social studies, two years of a foreign language. They have to have those two years of the same language. So like Spanish one, Spanish two, or French one, French two. Um, math, uh, preferably also algebra two and beyond because that algebra two really prepares them for the math they're gonna be taking in college. They'll have to do, and, and math beyond that as well. They're gonna have to do college algebra most likely. Um, and then academic credits. So if they've taken like, let's say like AP Psychology or, or if they, anything going beyond like the science and social studies and math, that's gonna go down as academic units, as their academic electives, okay? If they've gone beyond their high school graduation requirements. So again, that's a total of academic of 18 uh, that hopefully your child will have by the end of their senior year. Okay, so let's kind of talk about the college application process. So when should they apply? Early, they should apply early. Some of the state universities here in Florida will actually open up their application process sometimes at the end of July, depending on the school. That information is available on their website. You can Google it easily. They're all open right now. Um, so if you're a senior parent, they should be starting that process right now, hopefully, if they haven't already. Um, and also there's certain deadlines. So you're going to go over certain terminology that you may see on an application. Um, like what is rolling admission, priority, early action, regular decision. These are the things you may be seeing at some of our public universities here in Florida. Uh, these are the ones I'm gonna focus. There's other admission terminology, like early decision and stuff, but we don't have that with these public universities, so I'm just gonna focus on what they're gonna see with the SUS school. So rolling admission, when you see a school has rolling admission, usually a student could be applying anytime between now and like the end of April, and basically when they apply, then they'll find out a decision within a month or so or within a few weeks is just continuous. The thing with rolling though, uh, it's a little bit misleading because a lot of kids are like, oh yeah, well then I can apply in March and get better grades and, and that way I'll be ready, I'll be more prepared. But the problem with that is with rolling, as they accept more students, they don't have an infinite amount of spots they can offer students. So the more that they accept, the more the college is going to become selective in terms of what they're looking at the candidate because they only have so many spots available. There are some schools that are very popular, um, like UCF is one that's kind of on a rolling situation. So we always encourage the student to apply early. Yes? How early do you recommend? Now, I would say between, depending, first of all, you want to see if a school has a, has a deadline. Um, you're going to see if some schools have a priority deadline, like of November 1st is a very popular one. If they have a priority deadline of no, by November 1st, then please make sure they go by November 1st. Some of them have a priority deadline of October 15th. So you need to check, and that's the other thing, priority deadline, if a school has a priority deadline, apply by that priority deadline. Um, two reasons why. First of all, sometimes after the priority deadline, it's space available. The other thing is, remember I talked about how schools can offer certain scholarships? Okay, if they apply early enough and if they were an exceptional student, well, the priority deadline many times is a scholarship deadline as well. So you want to take advantage of that. Any school that says priority deadline, you want to make sure you do that. Um, you're going to notice some schools now in Florida, Florida Gulf Coast in particular, does something called early action, where there's it's like a first deadline. Um, again, it's an early action deadline. It's not restricted. It's not one that if you apply early, then you have to go to that school. Um, that's early decision. We don't have that here in Florida. This is early action. It's a non-binding decision. It's almost kind of like a priority deadline. Um, but usually when there's an early action deadline, then you're going to receive, like let's say there's an early action deadline of November, and then they'll tell you the decision will come out in January. It's not so much rolling. It's like, here's a deadline here, and this is when the student's going to find out. And then they have another deadline that's a regular decision deadline. And that regular decision application deadline could be the end of January, then they find out in March. 
Again, if a school has early action, I highly recommend that they do the early action. Okay? Because again, the longer you wait, the more it becomes like a space available type situation. Okay? So again, apply early. Apply early. Okay, so which schools to apply to? Okay, so this is what I like to call, don't put all your eggs in one basket. I hope you know what I'm talking about. Like, I want to go to the University of Florida. That's my first choice. That's my only school choice. And that's where I'm going to apply. Well, as you know, University of Florida is probably our most competitive university. It's nationally ranked. Uh, it's number seven and climbing. They, they really want to get into that top five spot in the nation. So they're becoming more and more competitive every year. So students need to make sure when they apply that they hopefully have like safety schools, they can have a REACH school, such as the University of Florida, or if they're applying to other schools out of the state, and, and then they have their realistic. So REACH schools, by definition, are those schools that, if you look at their mid-range requirements, what students have, have typically had to get into that school, and we'll go over that in a few minutes, um, the REACH school for those kids that are right there are even higher. They're higher than that. I mean, it's like, oh, 99.9% I'll probably get in. Okay, so hopefully when your child is applying for college, they, they have that, that, I'm sorry, safety school. They have that safe, that's what I want to do. They have that safety school that they're uh, applying for. So the safety school should be that ace in a hole that that's the, they meet all the requirements and beyond. Then you have your realistic schools. The realistic school um, is, they're like right there in the range. They may not be above, but they're certainly not below, but they're just kind of right there in that mid range. And, and most likely they may get in. But then yes, you have your reach school where your child may not be in that range. It may, in fact, they may be a little bit below. So it may be a little bit of a reach, but they should apply. They should be discouraged from applying because college admissions will tell us all the time, we do a holistic approach. Yes, we look at the grades, we look at test scores, we look at the type of courses you take, but we look at the application, we look at everything. And sometimes admissions is not black and white. There's some gray areas to it that we're not privy to. Okay, so even with reach school, if they have, if that's their dream school, have them apply and see. But keep in mind, they should have a backup. Okay, most schools when they're applying, most students when they're applying to the four-year universities, um, typically or when they're just applying to school overall, about four to eight. I'm not saying they have to apply to eight schools unless they really are serious about those schools, but that's about the average of what most kids are applying. And then there are some kids that apply to a couple of schools in the state, and then they're like, well. If I don't get into these two, then I, what I may do is go do two years at Palm Beach State and then transfer, which is still a great option. That's equivalent to the first two years of a four-year university. It's your AA degree, and then you can transfer and finish at, at the university or four-year college. Okay, so lots of options here is what I'm trying to say. Yes? Um, you could theoretically transfer without getting the AA. However, keep in mind that when they do that, the college, okay, let's say you just did one year and you didn't do an AA, you're still kind of finishing those um, general education courses. Typically what the university will do is they're still going to look at his, his or her high school record as well as what they're doing at Palm Beach State. With an AA degree, when you are in an AA degree in Associates of Arts, then they're just looking at that program. And you're not losing any time. And some kids, there are some kids now finishing their AA a lot sooner than two years because they're transferring over with AP and ACE credit or maybe some dual enrollment credit that counts towards that AA. So remember, yes, AA typically is two years, but there are kids that are finishing sooner than that. So keep that in mind. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> um, just a quick question. The Palm Beach State, um, I notice it's not listed as the state university system. Because I'm just focusing today on the four-year universities. Yes, all the two-year schools in Florida are under the state university, but as the two-year college program. So today's is just about the four-year. Yeah, but it is considered public, yes. And you can use Bright Futures, and they offer scholarships at, at Palm Beach State as well and other state colleges. Yes. What is the cost um, difference if they did the Palm Beach State? Palm Beach State for a year, depending on how many credits, can run anywhere between two to 4000 a year. Just depending on how much, but they also have, you can use Bright Futures. They're, they also have scholarship programs at Palm Beach State. They have a lot of foundation scholarships and, you know, and other state colleges as well. So yeah, there's a lot of financial aid that they can receive from their through scholarships. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, let's talk about the application.
application. What type of application are you going to see? Well, it's going to be online. There is no such thing as paper pencil application anymore. Everything is online, as you know. And there could be in our state, you know, again, I'm just exclusively talking today about the state universities. They're either going to have their own application, their institutional application. They're going to be on Common App, or they're going to be on Coalition. Or they could be using two of them, or all three of them. The important thing is that they just choose one application. You're going to notice that some universities will give them options. Like FSU, I'm going to show you an example, gives all three options. And some kids are like, what should I do? Should I do all three? No, do not do all three. They just, the reason they give options is because it's up to, it's, it's up to the student. And the universities don't prefer, prefer one over the other. They just want to provide that student an option because, um, and I'll get into it in a few minutes, certain applications, other universities use them as well. So it's just a matter of checking off which college they want that application sent to, like with Common App and Coalition works that way. So it's just to make it sometimes a little bit easier for them, um, for the students. Uh, it's all about options, but again, just choose one application. We were just at a meeting with all the state university uh, reps, and they say there are still, and they're not sure if it's a student or parent who's doing this, um, but there's still, like, kids are sending more than one application, and, you know, it becomes a problem. So they just need to choose one. That's all they need to choose. I'm going to use FSU as an example because they use all three. Um, again, when you, the way you would apply, you, you go on the university's website. Um, right when you get to the page, it, it can say undergraduate admissions or apply here, freshman admissions. You click one of those things, and it will bring you to their portal, okay, their undergraduate application portal. So this is FSU. Notice this one is for their, their own application, their institutional one, Common App, and Coalition. It gives those options. So if, if you were to click Common App, and this is how Common App kind of looks like, um, there's over 900 colleges and universities in the nation that use Common App. Uh, it's one application, and they do the application. It usually has an essay portion to it. Uh, if other schools, with the state schools, typically the colleges here in Florida just want them to do the general application and the essay. Um, but other universities, for instance, if they're applying to the University of Miami, they're on the Common App. And there are a lot of out-of-state schools are too. They may require other things, like letters of recommendation and so forth. Um, and it'll say on the coalition, or rather on the Common App, what parts they need to do depending on the college. It'll instruct them what to do. Yes? So for the essay part, like when I was applying for colleges, right, you know what your essay is going to be, you have time to consider it, and then you apply. Like if it's online, do you just have to like shoot from the hip? No. No, that's a good question. She asked is like basically to guess what the essay is going to be and so forth. No, they'll give them the prompt. They give them the, like the, get the essay. They will give them the essay prompt. Yes, whether they are doing a institutional application that requires an essay or Common App, the prompt will be there, and they will. We recommend that they just don't do it right away. That they take their time with the essay. I'm going to give some essay tips. But yes, they they thought they need to follow the prompt if the college requires the essay. Yes. First of all, a lot of them are going to give them multiple prompts, so they're going to choose. They can they could just Google like common out prompts and they'll see them. But when the student does an application, it's not like they have to do it all in one sitting and submit it. They save it. They're not submitting it until the end, so they can continually go back to it, uh, refine it. So. So they save it, it's just sitting there. Uh, the yeah, university's yeah. not looking at it yet. It's not until you have it finalized exactly yeah, the way you want that you hit yeah. that submit button and then they skew it. And once you submit it on Common App, then the university will download it. But they, they can't view it until you hit that submit button. Right. But you can go back to it over the course of weeks. If you want. And you can like upload PDF and resumes. Right, if the colleges request the resumes and so forth, you can upload it. Um, Common App asks a lot of questions specifically about, uh, just like any, a lot of the college applications, they'll ask about their activities. They may give the option to upload a resume, or they may tell them, fill out these sections about your activities. Either way, it's, it's a good idea to have a resume at hand, because even though they don't require it, it's a lot of tedious questions they ask about their activities, and having that resume on hand is very helpful, so yes. Uh, so, so yeah, when you, with any of these, whether it's an institutional application, Common App, or Coalition, which is another one that's kind of similar to Common App, you're going to form an account. So you can go back and forth, and it's like what Mr. Tweedy says, until you hit that submit button, you can keep on going back and, you know, tweaking whatever you need to be, needs to be tweaked, whether it's your activities or essay and so forth.
Okay, so yeah. Um, coalition, again, uh, schools like Florida, FSU, there's a lot of colleges using that, and, and also throughout the country. Uh, this is just another application that they can use, and it'll tell you, each university will tell you what parts they need filled out from them. Um, because coalition is like, is like Common App, where they also maybe require letters of recommendation, or council reports, or resumes, and so forth. But for our state schools, they basically just want the, the, the application itself and usually the essay, okay? Okay, so it's important with the application that you follow directions. Um, essay, I always say this is optional, I would still do the essay, and then there are some colleges that don't require an essay at all. But if it says optional, I would still do it. The essay is very important. Um, that's gonna be something that hopefully may kind of decide how your student may be different from another applicant. It may set them apart. Um, there's also test scores that have to be sent, your transcript, and some applications, but most of them are out of state or private, require a lot of recommendation, but our Florida schools do not. The only ones that may require one is FAMU, um, or Florida Polytechnic may take them as well. But I'm gonna go over these components right now. So the college essay. Again, the college essay is, not, is important not just because what's gonna set your applicant apart, but also this is the evidence to the college of admissions representatives of how well they can write as a college, as a potential college student. So they're looking at everything. This is not a completion grade. A lot of kids are like, oh, I'm just gonna do this essay big enough. They're looking at so many essays. They're, they're just gonna just kind of glance at it to make sure I did it. No, they read it. They spend a lot of time. There's committees that go over the same essay over and over again. So you want to make sure, hopefully, your child is looking at this and, and going over it over and over again before they submit it to make sure it's something that makes them stand out. In your packet, uh, you do have top 10 tips for writing college essay. We gave, we gave this to all of our seniors. We met with our seniors a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they all received this. Again, hopefully it's they're looking at their grammar, the mechanics, they're not relying on their spell checker. Uh, they're telling them, I went to a, a several college visits this summer with my daughter, and time and time again, these admission people would tell us when it came to the essay, it was so important to them that they said, tell us about the who and not about the what, okay? My takeaway from that is the essay should not be listing things that you've done and so forth. It should be really what makes your child unique. Uh, maybe it was a unique experience. Maybe it's a unique experience that they'll be able to contribute to that potential university. So these are just really good trips. We give these to our students uh, every year when they're seniors to kind of review and go over. Okay. Besides the application, they also have to report their SAT and ACT test scores. In your packet, in your yellow packet, um, I have SAT and ACT test dates here, just for the future. Again, um, some of you had asked me a question, when should they start taking this? Uh, we always recommend SAT and ACT, they start taking it in the spring of their junior year. Again, all juniors take the SAT for free in March. So we have the dates here for any, anything coming on after March, but when they, request their test scores to go to the university, they have to go back on the website. Though, if they did the SAT, they would go on College Board's website and request those test scores be sent to those potential colleges, and the same with the ACT. Keep in mind, you do have to pay for this. Uh, usually it's about $15 per report. When they sign up to take the SAT and ACT, they do have um, that advantage that if, that ask them, where do you want these scores to go? I think it's about five colleges or so, Four. There's four colleges that they can choose for free that you don't have to pay. And remember, keep in mind that SAT is a cumulative report, so when they send their SAT scores and they've taken it more than once, the colleges are going to see those scores and they're going to super score. They're going to super score. In Florida, all schools super score. The ACT, all colleges now in Florida will super score the ACT except for UCF. Okay? So keep that in mind. ACT, when you send in that report, it's not cumulative. It's per test date. So these are just things to keep in mind. And also, and, and remember, when a college re requests that you send in an official report, it's from College Board or ACT. However, there are some schools now that are allowing self-reporting where your child gets to just tell them what the scores are. However, keep that keep in mind that they're, they're, they're accepted to that school. They will have to ultimately submit an official test score. So they should report accurately. 
Okay. Another thing they have to submit as part of their application, again, we've gone over the application, we've gone over the uh, test scores, they have to submit a transcript. In your packet, I have a copy of the procedure to submit an official transcript, and it's through Parchment. We use the Parchment service. This is something, again, that they go on, they form an account, and they re can request where they want their official transcript sent to. And they can request virtually any school here in the nation. Um, it's usually $5 per transcript per official transcript. Okay, so that's Parchment. Now, there are some colleges that are now requiring, especially in Florida, uh, we have quite a few schools that are doing this in Florida, that they're not requiring an official transcript when they apply. Instead, they're requesting that the students do an SSAR. Uh, that's a self-reported student academic record, where yes, your child is self-reporting their grades that they had in high school. Um, Florida, FSU, FAU, Gulf Coast, Polytechnic, um, UNF and New College, they're all using this, this self-reporting. And they don't have to guess. It's going to be on their school, on the university website. When they're applying, there'll be something that says you need to self-report, here's the link. Okay? So when they go on that link, they should, they'll, they'll see this where they form an account and then they'll tell them what English class is, ninth grade, tenth grade. It's very step by step. Now, we caution students, they need to report accurately. Because if they're accepted into this school, guess what? Are they going to want to see an official transcript? Yes. Wherever the student is accepted and they decide to go to that school, wherever they decide to go, doesn't matter if the school uses an SSAR or not, you have to send a final transcript. So for those students who use the SSAR, the colleges will look at their final transcript at the end of the year. Okay? Even if the SSAR was not involved and there was an initial transcript, they still have to send that final transcript because here's the thing, when you're accepted into college, it doesn't matter whether it's in-state or out-of-state, that's conditional. It's conditional upon receipt of that final transcript. And what do they look at for the final transcript? Well, first, if it was a school that required the SSAR, they're going to check to see if they report it accurately. If it wasn't an SSAR situation, or even if it was, they're still going to look at the type of grades your child earned their senior year. And also, if they did not drop an academic class, see, when you apply for college, they're going to ask you what's on your senior schedule. And the students are going to write down all their classes. And let's say they dropped their physics class in January, or they ended up earning a D or an F in, a, in an academic class. A college can rescind, rescind their decision. So a college can rescind their decision, meaning, sorry, but you'll have to look elsewhere. They can rescind it either if you reported it inaccurately on the SSAR, or if your grades went down in academic classes, or if you dropped an academic course that you told the college you're going to take. And that may have been something that they considered for their initial decision. So keep in mind, senior year is very important. And also, if it's an SSAR situation that they're reporting accurately. Yes? Oh, they can do it in June. Yeah, that's, it's not fun. Yeah, they, they, usually it's in June. Because they, usually late June, because those transcripts don't go out until later. So, you know, because we have to wait, the district waits for the grades to be processed, so te technically, usually, those final transcripts go out at the end of June. That's why it's really important that they do well their senior year. Yes? It's my understanding that you're better off keeping your kids in the school for the complete day senior year, so that they're not moving off and they're not at home. Okay, so what you're, what you're asking about is in no 07. Go ahead. And so my question is, what percentage of the kids at Park Vista are here senior year for the full day versus out at like in other school or doing or participating in the virtual class. Okay, we don't have a percentage of students of how many students are off campus in your year. I will say this though, but you know, on behalf of my whole department, if a student is academic, we do have like an academic kid that may have six AP classes in a go seven. I mean, if they've been like this all day, and, and you know, that's fine. It's every student's going to be different. However, if you have a student that is doing like a four to virtual fifth period, and then a sixth and no seventh, and only has four academic classes, what kind of candidate does that student look like for a potential college admissions person? It all depends what they're taking. We have some kids that are doing dual enrollment. Okay, they may be doing one through six dual enrollment, like they may be doing one through five, some AP and honor classes, and then a dual enrollment sixth period, and then a no seventh. That may be okay, but it depends on the student. And that counselor would have that student's record and can see the progression on how they've been doing all four years. But no, we do not advocate that they're, the bottom line is, if they're going to a four-year university, that they need to be doing at least, at least five academic classes a year. And that's our... So you don't advocate for 
our philosophy. No, I don't think we have a number on how many. Do we have a number on how many kids have no seventh or? Seniors, I would say it's better than 50%. Right around 50%. Huh? Right around 50%. Yeah. They take it off like six But again, that, but again, there's different reasons for that. Yeah, there's, there's have, different reasons. Six APs, that's one thing. If, if I'm talking kids into taking, you know, their fifth academic class, and then they're saying, but I want to go to the University of Florida. Those things don't I'm like, that, I'm, I'm a math guy, that doesn't add up at all. You know, you're, you, want, you want to go to a competitive school, but you're not competitive. You're not, you don't look as competitive. And, and it's just the way it is. Like they, they ask us, especially on the Common App and all the, the online ones, uh, describe their senior year schedule. Very very much, much, most like, demanding, very demanding. The most demanding, so, you know, demanding, somewhat demanding, less demanding. So we're we're honest you ask that. I'm very yeah. honest about that. Kid has four academics, less demanding. The most demanding, demanding kids are making six or seven, seven APs. Those are our top, top kids are the most demanding. So you have to put that relative to what your child is. And just so you know, what's considered most demanding is AP, ACE, and dual enrollment. Okay, so those. You know, those are considered the highest level courses. Briefly, advanced placement and ACE are classes that the curriculum is here is on campus. At the end of the year, there's an exam, okay? The AP advanced placement exam is from the college board, the same people who do SAT. So they take this exam at the end of the year, and if they earn a three, four, or five, five being the highest, they can potentially earn college credit. It just transfers that credit, not as a certain grade. Just it potentially, you know, depends how the university is going to take that credit. ACE is University of Cambridge. It's also a college level course taught here on campus. They have their own exam at the end of the year, completely independent of the grade that they earn in the class. Their grading scale is A, B, C, D, E, or U. If a student earns A through E, they could potentially earn college credit at the university, depending on the college. And the dual enrollment is when they're physically taking a class in a college, Palm Beach State, FAU, for example, they're earning high school and college credit. They're earning an actual grade in that class. So they are theoretically already starting their college transcript. So they want to do well in those courses. If they're making C's, they're starting college with a 2.0 GPA. So those are the difference, more, more or less, you know, the basic differences. Okay? So yeah, with these type of questions, like no seventh, no sixth, the bottom line is it depends what your child's plan is. If they're looking at top, very accelerated elite schools, yes, the, they, they want to see most rigorous and best grades. Okay, so it just depends on what their plans are and so forth. Yes? Do you allow any kids who, who don't have the credits yet to graduate to get out of school early? No, we have minimum standards. Okay. So, yeah, you have to, to have a, if you're a senior, if you have one free period, you have to have at least 19 credits and a 2.0. And to have two free periods, you have to have at least. Yeah, they have to be. They, yeah, we just. And it has to be with parent permission. Yeah. Yeah, keep that in mind as well. We, if they tell us we want to know seven, we just go, oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> there's, there's forms that have to be filled out. The course registration sheet also has a place for a parent to initial and also the, the signature. So, yes, that's something that. Because they're leaving campus when, you know, the school day ends at 245, so we just don't do this. Um, if you have suspicions that your child may have a, have a no seventh that you weren't sure you approve it, you can always contact the counselor. Because we look at signatures, but we're not handwriting experts. So if we see a signature, we will take it. So if there's ever a doubt in mind, just contact your individual counselor. Yes? Um, so if my child then chooses, you know, these AP scores and then decides that you're a little bit too much and he drops it at one of those classes, then that is potentially detrimental to Yes, her question is if her child, senior year, okay, senior year, because, well, junior year, they're going to see the classes that were complete when they turn in that transcript. Senior year, there is a section on the application that asks, what classes are you taking this year? Okay, what is your curriculum for this year? And let's say they apply in October, and let's say one of their classes was AP Psychology or Physics, any kind of academic course. And let's say they drop that course in January. Potentially, a college could say, you know, you, you lessened your rigor, we could rescind. Is it a definite? 
Not necessarily. Could it happen? Yeah, it could. Okay. So we always, when we have that situation, we try to caution students, let's see what you can do to bring your grade up and so forth. We know there's exceptions, but I, I know as counselors always say, you need to call, if you're accepting the college, you need to call that college and let them know that's going to be okay. Okay? So, yeah. Quick question. Yes. Do they submit, so they do an SSAR and they submit their transcript? Both? Some, no. Well, initially, there are some colleges, for instance, these universities here, University of all those schools, they require the SSAR initially, not a transcript. However, all schools will want a final transcript. Does that make sense? No, not really, because it's two sets of times that you have the training grades. The first time when you apply, whether through transcript or SSAR, and then the last time, everyone has to turn in the transcript. Because that's when the colleges are checking to see if you've dropped any academic courses, if your grades went down, um, if you did use an SSAR, did you report accurately? Okay, did you make sure you reported accurately? So no, it's always two times, but the first time some use SSAR, some use a transcript. For the final one, you're only sending the transcript to the college you're enrolling. Yeah, it's not. To, it's only where you're going. It's not to every. No, obviously, it's going to be to the one that you're going to go to. They require that. Yes. Um, as far as getting accepted into, I'm going to use University of Florida, being the highest uh, level school out there. If somebody uh, does not have a rigorous enough courses here at high school and does not get accepted to Florida, but then goes to Palm Beach State for two years, does well there, are they then more likely to get accepted? To okay, so he has a very good question. Let's say they chose University of Florida, but they did not get in. Um, can go into like Palm Beach State a two-year state college. Do they have a chance as a transfer student? Well, yes, so there's always that opportunity. Um, just keep in mind, though, through the state articulation, if they do an AA degree in the state, they are guaranteed admission into at least one university in the state of Florida. It may not be the one of their choice. So if they're looking at University of Florida, okay, which, yes, they'll have that opportunity. You just want to make sure, well, even, even whatever their plans are, when they go into the state college, you want to be a great student. So make sure that they're still very competitive, that they're doing great, great, doing, earning great grades there and so forth. But yes, they are, they do have that opportunity to apply again to University of Florida as, as a transfer student. But they wanted it's it's not automatic that they're gonna go in. And some schools have articulation, like um, I know, and I'm not even saying that your child has to go to Santa Fe, but there is a state college near Florida, Santa Fe, that they 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 a lot of the state colleges that are near the universities, like Valencia near UCF, Santa Fe near UF, they sometimes have some little direct connects situations as well, but we've had students go to Palm Beach State and yes, continue on to a competitive school, provided that they did very well. I was just going to say, yeah, a lot of the state universities, regionally, they're aligned with their state colleges. So, for example, UCF, we mentioned Valencia, but there's actually six colleges that surround UCF. That, that was just an example. State colleges that you, if you earn your AA from that state college, you're guaranteed admission to UCF. Now, if you wanted to apply to UF, unless you went to Santa Fe or one of their aligned regional schools, you have to apply as an AA transfer, and then it's competitive. For example, like FAU, you're guaranteed admission to FIU or to FAU, but if you wanted to go to UCF, you have to apply as an AA transfer, and then it's a competitive process. Okay. So, and you're going to see on your matrix, they have, um, I'll show you later, but they also give the two plus two of certain programs that work with those schools directly. That's on the main what, I'll show that later. What, what's that term again for these, these aligned schools? Um, it's like a direct connect. They all have a different name. Yeah, okay. Direct, they, right, but they're regionally aligned. Yeah. They're they're, yeah, exactly. So it's on the matrix that I'll show you when we get to that por portion. Yes. I'm going to go over that. That's top 10%. Yeah, you have a lot of questions, and I, I promise I will go over them when we get to that part. Yes. Okay, so this is what the SSAR account looks like. Um, when they do the SSAR, okay, um, remember I said they had to report accurately, a tool that they should be using. Remember SIS? Uh, this has become so helpful. Not only can they see, you can see their current grades, attendance, how they're doing, but your students can view their academic history of all the final grades they've ever earned. So we strongly encourage your students, in fact, they need to do this. When they do the SSAR, remember they have to report accurately to use their, SS, their SIS link that they have, you know, they have access to where they can access their final grades. Um, again, 
the resume itself, we had a question about the college resume. There are some universities who will say that you can upload a resume. Others, like I said, have those questions that they ask about their activities. And having that resume is, is, is very handy. Um, also, the college, and as I said before, our SUS schools here in Florida really don't require one, except for maybe one or two. But all the other colleges, a lot of colleges that are private or the elite school or some out-of-state schools, they may require a lot of recommendation. That resume should be given to the, the person who's going to be doing the letter on their behalf, whether it's one or two teachers or us, the school counselors, for instance, Covenant. Um, for a lot of the private schools, we have to do the school uh, secondary report, and having that resume is very helpful because we do have to write a letter, and we also have to answer questions about that activities. We know your child's academic history, but we don't necessarily uh, know everything that they've done in high school, whether it's community service, uh, jobs, leadership position, clubs, and sports. Uh, and we always tell the student, please, 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 Give us at least a couple of weeks to complete this, because whether it's a teacher or ourselves who need to do this, because um, you know we have other kids that are asking us, and there's other things that we do, and so forth. That's part of our job, so we do need the time to do it. And, and there's also scholarships. When your child is applying to some private scholarship, they may require a lot of recommendations, so that resume is handy. Um, there's a website. I'm sorry you can't see. It's called In Like Me. If you just want to write it down, I like this website a lot because it gives. Uh, it gives a lot of college advice, scholarship searches, and also they, they have templates for um, resumes. Okay, free templates. Also, tips on essay writing. What's the name of the in Like Me. In like me. All together, In Like Me. You can Google it. So this has a lot of good information on there. Okay, this is just a sample of a resume. You know, their academic history, honors, awards, extracurricular volunteer. You know. Um, you can also Google resumes, high school resumes, and find out other information. And yes, there is an application fee. Applications about for the state universities in Florida are over thirty dollars typically. Um, remember, they're applying to more than one. They will be paying thirty dollars each. There are application fee waivers. Uh, students, the most common fee waiver in the state is the College Board fee waiver. So if your student has taken the SAT for free, and I'm not talking about the free junior test that they take, that's not part of it. This is if a student, because they were on free reduced lunch, they qualified for a fee waiver. If you're on free reduced lunch, you're eligible for two fee waivers for the SAT and two fee waivers for the ACT. All the students need to do is see our guidance secretaries before school, after school, during lunch, and they'll have those fee waivers available, and they have the list of their students who are on free reduced lunch. But with the College Board fee waiver, if they have been on, for instance, if they've used the SAT fee waiver at least one time, then they are able to receive application fee waivers for several universities, so they don't have to pay that fee okay, if they're in that situation. There's also another one called NACAC, um, that if they don't use the College Board, then, but most of them do, then most often they'll do the NACAC one, and, and the counselor can fill that out. Okay, so right now I'm going to quickly go over all of our state universities here in Florida. I'm going to give some little tidbits about each school. And what I want to refer to right now, this is what I was talking about where you can find out about like certain 2 plus 2 programs. In your yellow packet, um, I gave you two, uh, two types of matrix here. This one's a cheat sheet one. This is the most updated information from our state university system, hot off the press from two weeks ago. Uh, Really quick way to see what the class of 2019 had on average um, and what was accepted on average, the mid-range. There could have been students accepted with less GPA or higher or less SAT scores or higher. This was the average, the mid-range. So if you look at, for instance, Florida Atlantic FAU, um, just so you know how to read this quickly, students who were accepted had on average a GPA, this is the recalculated weighted, remember the 0.5 for honors, full quality point for APAs so or dual enrollment, um, based on their academic units, this is the core recalculated GPA. Those students have between a 3.58 and a 4.18. Um, SAT score, remember that's out of 1600, mid-range 1120 to an 1160, uh, and then their ACT score, that's out of 36, which is between the 24 and the 29. And then we also give like more or less the deadline where they stop looking at the applications and so forth. So this is just a quick review, but then the other one I want to show you, uh, I want to bring to your attention, this is even more detailed. Um, it's these two papers right over here. Um, if you look at the first one, which is actually the second one, it says SUS 2019-2020. 
This gives you even more information. It tells you, for instance, what type of application you're going to use. Um, it also goes over the GPA, CT, and ACT, uh, whether waivers are accepted, whether they use the SSAR, see how helpful this is, um, whether they super score, the, when they close admission. And then on the other page, which is right before, and I'm sorry for the confusion here, um, remember the transfer programs we talked about, how they all have different names? I think you had asked. This over here will tell you which regional, what the name of the programs are that they that are like two plus two. So for instance, like FAMU has the Ignite program. That's when they work with area state colleges in terms of having that direct connect to them. Okay. FAU is Lake uh, University of Florida. Where are you, you uh, That one has uh, like a gate. They, they do, they have like an engineering and design and construction program that comes from Santa Fe. Uh, so this is just different programs that they have that you can explore, okay? okay? It's very helpful. Um, we have the fees here, everything from on-campus to books and supplies. So this is it's just a useful thing to have, and it's the most updated. This is as of the class of 2019. So right now I'm going to kind of go over the universities very briefly. I, I know you guys have asked so many good questions, and I'm so sorry that we're going we're kind of going over time, but. I'm now going to go over each college and give some little background about each school. I'm going to focus on the large schools first. There are six large universities here in Florida. The first one is University of Central Florida. Uh, I'm sorry? Is this in our packet? No. But you're going to, you can view it again on our school website. Uh, if you go on Parkes' website and click School Counseling and click Copy Talk, you'll see the PowerPoint. So I'm just going to highlight a few things just for your awareness. So University of Central Florida, it is the largest in the state and in the nation, as I said before. It is in a suburban area in the city of Orlando. So it's a large school. It is primarily now on campus. It used to be a very um, commuter type school. Uh, now it's mostly residential. A lot of students live on campus and off campus. Uh, they have all types of degrees from associates to doc uh, doctoral degrees. Uh, some of their unique facilities, they have a lot of research labs here, um, in optics, lasers, uh, biomolecular science, forensic. They have a great forensic science program that has been there for many, many years. Great job placement from that program. Most popular majors, business, health profession, psychology, education, engineering, biology, uh, interdisciplinary studies, and visual performing arts. Um, I'm not going to go over the GPA and HPA range because you have that in your matrix. It is a very selective school. It's a very popular school because it has all types of programs. And it's got the big school setting. There's a lot of internship opportunities in Orlando. Okay, there's whether it's from uh, Lockheed Martin or the health, the health, there's a lot. There's Orlando Health, there's uh, Florida Health. There's a lot of opportunities where they can be doing internships. And it has the plus of big school theme, the Division One college team that's done very well. So lots of opportunities here, but again, each school, just because it's like, wow, it sounds great, You're, every child is different. Some school kids want a smaller school or a medium-sized school, maybe not as large. So I'm just going to tell you what each school kind of more or less has to offer. Um, we were just in a meeting, so I'm just going to give you some other tidbits about UCF. They now have a downtown campus uh, that's also in connection with Valencia, where there's uh, nine degree programs that they're offering there, whether it's in um, digital media, communications, public service, health related, but it's a living learning community. So now there's this beautiful campus downtown Orlando with dorms there, internship opportunities, you're taking classes there and everywhere. UCF has the top 10 night program. So yes, if your child is in the top 10% when they apply their senior year and have a 1090 SAT or 21 ACT, and they apply by January 15th, that is another pathway to enter UCF. It's a very popular program. Okay, they've always had that for a while. Um, those are the programs they have there that a student can apply for. For instance, the LEAD Scholars Program is a two, if your student was very involved in high school, in community service, maybe they were an SGA and they were a great student, this is a continuation where, again, it's a living learning community where they're uh, in dorms with the students that are also in this program. They're taking leadership classes. Uh, it's a two-year program, and uh, it, it's, it's something also to look into if your child was very involved in high school. Okay, University of Florida is our next one. Um, this is probably the most competitive university in our state, only because they've just been aspiring to be one of the reasons in the top five. There's a lot of research facilities on this campus. Um, you have Shands Hospital, so they have a great medical program there as well. 
Uh, it's in a small city, but Gainesville, I don't know if you've been to Gainesville lately, it's kind of exploding. Um, east, west, it's a lot of good stuff happening there. Uh, it offers all types of degrees. Uh, they have um, some of their facilities, again, I mentioned about the hospital, they have a natural history museum, a lot of research lab, genetic research center. Uh, their popular majors are engineering, business, biology, social science, communications, health, agriculture, psychology. Um, their, I guess, coalition and common app are one of the two you can apply through. It is very competitive. I remember I said they were number seven, number two in best value. Um, there's other pathways to admission there, though, just so you know. There's the Innovation Academy. Okay, the innov that's when they apply. They, if a student is interested in one of the intervention, like a one of the intervention degrees that they have, there's like about 30 of them that you can see on their website, plus a minor in innovation. Then that is something that they can look into. However, they're only going to school the spring and summer each term. Okay, um, a student may be offered, and they have to check off that they want that and do an essay. Pace program. Some students are now being offered pace. The thing with these, though, is they're not starting on campus right away. They have to do 60 hours roughly online before they start campus. So I'm just mentioning other pathways. Again, November 1st is their deadline. They have to apply by November 1st, and this year they're going to receive their decision by February 28th. Okay, Florida State University. Uh, they have uh, gone up in the ranks as well. They're number 18, number 9 in best value, uh, over 33,000. Again, Tallahassee is a small city, but with a very urban feel to it. Uh, so, kind of like a city-like feeling, but in a smaller area. Uh, Four-year college, obviously, all, everything going through doctoral degrees. Uh, they have a lot of uh, new facilities as well, like a marine laboratory. Um, they have a lot of research, especially biology. I went, I toured there a couple years ago, and they're really promoting their biological sciences program now. Uh, so, their top majors, business, social science, biology, psychology, uh, security and protective services, English, visual and performing arts. They're very big into social science. There's a lot of students who want to go into law or poli-sci, and there's internship opportunities because it's the state capital. Okay, so these are things to kind of keep in mind. They have a great music program. Of our public universities, it's probably one of the best ones in the state. So this is something to keep in mind as well. And they have, in terms of their deadlines, November 1st is their priority. So if their child is very interested in MSU, they need to apply by November 1st, and they will find out the decision by January 30th. Um, after that, it's rolling until March 1st. So again, if they're interested in FSU, they need to apply by November 1st. University of South Florida, Tampa, big school, the big city. Um, it's primarily, it, it's still a lot commuter, but they have a lot of dorms that they built there. They've done a lot of changes to the campus. It is a beautiful school. Uh, their most popular programs are in the health professions. Um, a lot of students who become doctors and so forth have gone through USF. They have a great medical program there. Business, biology, social science, communication, engineering, psychology. Uh, they're, uh, they've become very selective throughout the years. You, know, you can apply to coalition or institutional. And some of their major things that they have, first of all, they're actually rated as number four in the state as a public university, number 11 in social mobility in the nation, number six in best value. Um, engineering and business have become very popular. They have different campuses though. There's a USF in St. Petersburg that has like a liberal arts program. There's one in Sarasota, Manatee, which has a new risk management insurance major. Uh, also, UTSF with Stetson Law has a three plus three program now where they can do three years as an undergrad and they continue and do three years at Stetson, okay? Um, and then to earn their law degree. So that's just an interesting thing about them too. Oh wow, what did I do here? Okay. Uh, Florida Atlantic, let's head back home to Boca Raton, or near home anyway. Um, Four-year university, Boca, as you know, is a smaller city, still a little bit of a suburban feel. Uh, they are a school that's becoming more and more competitive every year. Uh, they accepted 59%. They have institutional online and common app. Uh, they have an environmental center. Their marine science program is very popular. Ocean engineering, marine life. Uh, they have Harbor Branch Research. Their top majors, business, inter interdisciplinary studies, health profession, psychology, biology, social, communications, and security and protective services. Uh, FAU. Okay. Um, one of the programs now with FAU, I'm trying to see how they made your changes here. Okay. 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 
Oh, I'm sorry, FAU, they have a new program in artificial intelligence. Um, remember there's the Wilkes Honors College. So FAU has a branch in Jupiter for students who want to do their honors program. They do have to live there their first year there, I think the first year in the Jupiter campus. It's nice, smaller class sizes and so forth. Um, again, they can apply for that through the Common App. And if they apply for the Wilkes Honors, they will be considered also for FAU. Okay? Uh, their deadline, they have rolling admission through April 15th. However, for scholarship, it's very advisable that you apply by December 1st. Okay? Uh, and again, their, their nursing program is very popular. Uh, they say that it, it's become very popular throughout the years, and if your child is interested in nursing, that they take a second major with it because it's so competitive. Okay, FIU, Miami. Very urban setting, big university, primarily commuter campus, but again, they're building more.